أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد والصلاة والسلام على أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين سيما مولانا وسيد صاحب الأسر والزمان روحي وأرواح العالمين له الفداء وأجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف ولانة دائمة على أعدائهم المنكر فذائلهم من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين أما بعد رب يشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحلو الأقضة من لساني يفقه قولي First off, my dear brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And also wanted to repeat the sentiments of Eid Mubarak to all of us here today. And also wanted to um, also appreciate and thank the executive for inviting me for, uh, to be here with, uh, with the community for this last week. And inshallah, we hope that uh, all of us are able to benefit from the programs we had this week. And if I've said anything uh, out of line to hurt anybody's feelings, it wasn't intentional. I ask for your forgiveness from anything which was said. And inshallah, we hopefully can... Uh, learn and grow and uh, continue to be servants of the Ahlul Bayt alayhum wassalatu wassalam and work to strive together to earn the pleasure of Allah and to be on the path of Muhammad and Ali Muhammad till the day that we leave this world. One salawat upon Muhammad and Ali Muhammad. Thank you. I just want to spend a few minutes this evening to look at you know, the reasons why we're gathering tonight and why we had all these events over this last week. And that was obviously the event of the Hajj. And obviously understanding that many of us probably have been for Hajj, many of us haven't been for the Hajj. But you know, the, the experience is, is very unique because obviously there's nothing like it really in the world today. Even if you look at all the other major world religions that are out there, you don't see an event as on the level of, of, of the Hajj, where you have three million people, for example, from so many different nationalities and backgrounds that gather for a short period of time. And you know, it's, it's obviously something that we, if we have the opportunity to make that pilgrimage to Mecca and to Medina, and to those lands that are associated and that we visit in the Hajj, it's something that we hopefully don't ever forget. Because it doesn't always come every year, you know, it's not like the prayers, the salat that we do. Every day we pray five, day, five times a day. Hajj is once in a lifetime. So the salat we do every day, so we become accustomed to it and it's there as a part of our lives. Fasting in the month of Ramadan is one month out of the year and after that it's done. Our khums is usually once in a year we take it out. The zakat is, you know, maybe one time a year. So all of the actions that we usually do, although khums and zakat may be taken out on a regular basis as well, some take it out on a monthly basis or what have you, but these are relatively simple acts to do. They don't involve a lot of difficulty. They're, you know, they're localized. They're within your home, within your business, within your school, within your, the vicinity where you live. But hajj is one of those actions which you, know, you need to leave, obviously, your family if you're going alone, flying thousands of kilometers away to a strange land, to an unknown territory, you leave your family behind, you leave your work, your business, your school, you leave everything behind to make this journey which happens really only once in a lifetime. People go many times for the Hajj, but even if you speak to them, usually they'll say that the first is the most memorable because it's a new experience for the individual at that time. I want to just look at, and this is all a talk on a theoretical basis because what I want to present to this evening are the four dimensions of the Hajj that we should be experiencing. But unfortunately for us as a Muslim community, we relegated a lot of our actions from the spiritual realm to be just a ritual act, whether it be the praying or fasting or any of the acts of worship that we do, and the Hajj included, unfortunately, for many Muslims throughout the world today, is just a theory. It's an act that we perform as a ritual because we're obligated to do it once in our lifetime. But unfortunately, a lot of the benefit, a lot of the wisdoms and philosophies which are behind the Hajj remain unknown to a lot of people. We don't really delve deep into the action before we go for the Hajj. You know, when we go on these groups and you have the group organizer, they'll tell you, take this, take tea bags, take milk, take sugar, take your chevro, take all of your, your spices from back home, because you don't get that in Mecca and Medina. And so we take suitcases full of food that we are accustomed to here, but we don't really spend time to actually 
look at the wisdom behind the Hajj and what we're actually going for. It's not just, uh, you know, like an African safari that we're going to do. It's not just an Arabian safari. It should be something much greater than that. You know, right off when we look at the Hajj in the Quran, we have this very beautiful verse from chapter number 3, verse 69, Surah Ali Imran, which shows us that Hajj is an obligation upon us as believers, at least once in our lifetime. And as the verse says, وَلِلَّهِ أَلَى النَّاسِ حِجُّ الْبَيْتِ مَنْ اسْتَتَاعَ إِلَيْهِ سَبِيلًا A pilgrimage to the house is incumbent, it is an obligation upon men, meaning humanity, not, not, the, not the gender of men, but human beings on a whole, for the sake of Allah, upon everyone who is able to undertake the journey. Now obviously to undertake the journey, there are, there are you know, qualifications we have, you have to be of age, you have to have the financial ability, the road to Hajj must be open. There are a lot of conditions for the Hajj to become you know, an obligation, a wajib upon somebody. And when you reach all of those qualifications, so you have the age, you have the physical ability, you have the mental ability, the road isn't blocked, you can fly, you can get the visa for the Hajj, you have the money to make the pilgrimage. We're told by our ulama that that year Hajj becomes wajib upon you. You know, just like today, we prayed Maghrib and Isha just a short time ago. We had to have the tahara, we had to have wudu, we had to have pure clothing on, we had to know the direction of the Qibla, all of those things were there, and then we had to pray. And if we didn't pray right now Maghrib and Isha, and we delayed it till past midnight, then it would become qadha, and we would have committed a sin. We would have broken one of the rules of Allah. Well, the hajj is similar. If you have all of the criteria that the scholars enumerate for us, and you don't go for hajj in that year, you've committed a sin against Allah. You've broken a rule and one of the ordinances that Allah has laid down. And then Allah says, وَمَنْ كَفَرَ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ غَنِيٌ عَنِ الْعَالَمِينَ but if a person denies or doesn't bother to go for hajj, he rejects the hajj and he has or she has the ability, Allah says that indeed Allah is self-sufficient above all of the worlds. And if you look at how the Prophet and the Ahlul Bayt have described the hajj in the hadith, they actually tell us that if a person has the ability to make the pilgrimage and they don't do it, and they die without going to hajj, he says that they can die on any other religion, but they have not died as Muslims. And the hadith actually mentions that you die as a Yahud or a Nasara, either as a Jew or a Christian, meaning you're somebody who has not died on the ways of Muhammad and Ali Muhammad. So the Hajj is very important to realize that when we have the ability, when we have that financial means and the physical means that we make that journey, we don't wait until we're 40 or 50 years old and think that, you know, once I get to that age of maturity, and I've committed so many sins, then I'll go to Hajj and I'll clean myself off all of my sins. Because none of us really know when we'll leave this world, first of all. And none of us know if we'll have the material means or the physical ability to go to Hajj when we're 40, 50, or 60 years old. Because as you know, Hajj itself is a difficult act of worship to do. A lot of walking, a lot of traveling, and nobody knows will they have the ability to do that at that, end, you know, that, that latter stage of their life. The four dimensions of the Hajj, which I want to look at very briefly this evening, and again, this is all theory because unfortunately, again, as Muslims, we've never, we haven't really realized the full potential of the Hajj. Three million people were there this year, the Hajj. Three million, whatever, hundred thousand people were there this year, as was the last many, many years in the past. But we still see the situation, the condition of the Muslims as it is today. And so these four dimensions that our scholars have given us of what the Hajj should bring about in ter terms of an internal change, internal revolution, are things which, again, are, are beautiful on paper, and they look nice, but we haven't really put them together as a community, a community of Muslims, to actually realize these within our own lives. We have an ethical dimension for the Hajj, we have a political dimension, there's a cultural dimension and aspect, and finally there's a financial dimension to the Hajj rituals. Looking at the first one, which is the ethical dimension. You know, when you talk of ethics and morality in Islam, the akhlaq that Islam teaches us, basically what we understand from that term is how we live as a human being. How we interact with our family, with our community, with our community of believers, and, and also the greater community even of non-believers that we live within. And the most powerful part and aspect of the Hajj is the way that we actually go into the ihram. You know, we can go as common people from Canada, 
You'll have kings and princes go from other countries. You'll have millionaires who will travel to the Hajj, who will stay in five, six-star hotels. And then you'll have the people who have saved their entire life and maybe even journeyed by foot from North Africa or, or other parts of the world actually making the journey to Mecca on the back of an animal. But when you get to Mecca and you, or you get to the Mikat even and you remove your external clothing and you put on the ihram, then you don't know who the millionaire is back home and who the, you know, the person who's on, on, on a very meager subsistence. You don't know who drives that BMW back in their home country and who just rides a bicycle in the streets. Even we know in the Hajj and the Ihram, you don't even wear jewelry. So rings, watches, necklaces, bracelets, all of those things come off. So nobody knows who anybody is in the Hajj. Even when you go, and if, and if there are ever presidents of countries, and there are sometimes presidents of the Muslim countries that go, they may have some security around them perhaps. But even then, we know that even that is very minimal. I mean, they don't carry guns, for example, in the Haram. So you really can't tell who is who. So that whole material ostentation, that showing off that pride of who we are back home, is removed at the time of the Hajj for those five or six days that were in that holy land. And in, in addition, we know that during the time of the ihram, that 25 things become forbidden for the person in the ihram. 25 things which normally are allowed, something as simple as looking in the mirror, looking at your own reflection, that becomes forbidden in the ihram. To wear perfume, to smell something which is a good fragrance, even to walk by a restaurant, or walk by, let's say, a fruit vendor which is selling good smelling food, and for you to take in that aroma is actually forbidden in the ihram. So if you look at all of those 25 things and you look at the state of ihram and, and what happens and how we change ourselves, we realize that that really becomes one of the ethical dimensions of the hajj, that if we can carry that forward, and that doesn't mean we wear ihram when we come back, but we realize when we come back even to our own homes that we are not as high and mighty as we think we are. That we're at the end of the day all servants of Allah. And yes, Allah may have given some wealth greater than other people and this is the providence given to us by Allah but at the same time we realize that at the end of the day we're all servants of Allah and that we need to remove that level of pomp and arrogance and pride that we sometimes tend to have and come back down to a level of being normal human beings. The second level is the socio-political dimension of the Hajj and we see that the Hajj is one of those few actions in Islam and in any of the world religions really which combines every race of Muslims. And you know when you go to the Hajj, unfortunately again I say this is theory because we know when we go for Hajj, the kafalas, the caravans that we go with are usually based upon our own ethnic group. So the Khojas tend to go with a Khoja group, Pakistanis will go with a Pakistani group, Afghanis will go with an Afghani group and so on and so forth. And there's nothing wrong with that at one level because they're comfortable with their language, with their cultural settings, and it may be difficult to come out of that comfort zone that we're in. But we do realize when we get to Mecca and Medina and we're able to actually go and talk to other Muslims, whether they be of the followers of Ahlul Bayt or another background, it doesn't really make a difference at that level because we're all doing the same acts of worship. But we see that we have, again, that ability to talk to one another to find out what's happening in other parts of the world that we wouldn't hear from the mainstream media. We might not be able to do anything, you know, and help one another, but at least our eyes are opened to the realities of what's happening around the Muslim world. And again, we don't see this happening on that great level that was envisioned by the religion of Islam. Although there are pockets of experiences in which, you know, scholars from, from, um, from many, many different backgrounds open and they have actually, um, you know, cultural centers in Mecca in which Muslims can come and talk and, and get information on other countries. But it's not as how Islam envisioned that religion, that, 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 rather that, that religious event of the Hajj to be something which would actually change the socio-political outlook of the believers who are making that pilgrimage. The third thing that we see is the cultural dimension of the Hajj. And what we actually benefit and learn from is that although we do have cultural differences, but when we look at the Hajj, we see that everybody is basically doing the acts together. Again, when we look at, at our own communal, communal level, 
we see that we have, for example, a center which is frequented by the Hoja community, or one by the Pakistani community, or one by the Arabic speaking, or one by the Persian speaking. And again, in and of itself, these are no problem. It's not a, it's not a problem to have centers which are differentiated by language or culture or these sorts of things. But unfortunately, a lot of times when we have these cultural centers, they become more of a cultural center rather than a religious center. And it becomes difficult to break you know, the barriers which exist between the different communities. So everybody does their own thing, but we don't ever have a time to get together and, and pray together, to worship together, to speak together about issues which affect all of us as a community. This shouldn't, and this was never meant to be one of the things of the Hajj, even the religion of Islam, because even when you look in the Quran, and where Allah talks about how He created you and I as human beings, we see that Allah says that He created us in many different nations, many different tribes. Allah tells us that we are of different colors. He tells us we have different languages. So Allah tells us in the Quran that we have been created to have different languages, which is not a problem. You speak English or French or Spanish or Arabic, there's not a problem with that. One person is black, one is white, one is brown, one is yellow. There's no issues within Islam at that level. And the Quran again beautifully speaks about the fact that Allah put these differences and variances within the human race to be variety in life. But the problem comes is where we compartmentalize ourselves and we basically box ourselves up into these little groups. And we don't allow ourselves to leave that little comfort zone that we're in and go and experience other communities and other ethnic backgrounds. So Hajj at one level seeks to also to break those boundaries that exist between different races. And obviously when you're there and you see people from China who are Muslims who are doing the tawaf right beside you, or you see people from West Africa, or people from India, or from Bangladesh, or from North America who have converted to Islam. You see so many people of different nationalities and backgrounds that you really enjoy that this religion is so universal. You know, it's not like some other religions out there today. There's other religions out there today where the one billion followers are all from the same ethnic background, right? They all look the same, they all eat the same food, they all have the same language. But Islam is, is a beauty in that way, in that we have so much of a variety in the way that we, uh, you know, that we represent the religion. So the third dimension that we see is that there is a cultural dimension to the Hajj, that we also need to be able to experience there and bring it back to ourselves, back to our community when we come back, to be able to, again, remove these artificial barriers that we sometimes create amongst ourselves and amongst our different community centers. The fourth and the final aspect that our scholars show us, and which also the Quran directly alludes to, is the financial dimension of the Hajj. You know, people think, okay, you go for Hajj, and, and this is how it is, again, in, on a practical level today. People say, okay, you go for Hajj, and it's an act of worship. You go, you pray, you do the tawaf, you do all these actions, and that's it. And people don't think that, you know, there's no financial benefit to going for the Hajj in terms of business and com commerce and trade. But actually, the ver there's one verse of the Quran where Allah tells us that there is no problem on you if when you finish the Hajj, you go and seek the fadl, the grace and the bounties of Allah. And in fact, even if you see at the time of the early Islamic history, people would actually come to Mecca, even during the Hajj time, and they would be engaged in buying and selling goods. People would come from distant Muslim countries and lands. They would bring what they produce in that country, they would bring it into Mecca, and they would sell it, and then they would take that money back home with them. Unfortunately, today we don't see that. You know, today you go to Hajj, and you give your money to Ronald McDonald, because you go to McDonald's after your tawaf, outside of Bob King Abdul Aziz, or you go to KFC, and you buy your Coca-Cola, and you put all the money back into these kind of companies. Rather than having Muslims, you know, engaged in business and trading, you know, people who would be living in other countries could bring their goods to Mecca and have an open market, for example, where you could buy and sell things from different countries. This doesn't happen, unfortunately, because of big business taking over and the whole you know, consumerism taking over Mecca. Even if you see these big towers that the Saudi government created right behind Masjid al-Haram, you know, where they destroyed, for example, the house of Khadija alayhi salam and built bathrooms where Khadija alayhi salam used to live. Or they destroyed the house where the Prophet was born you know, and they built whatever it is that they built. And in fact, even the Mount of Abu Qubais, a mountain which was in Mecca, now there is a Saudi palace on top of it. 
And just today I read an article in the Guardian newspaper from the UK, and this was actually given as news back in 2007 that the Saudi government are now destroying the graves of Rasulullah. They want to remove the grave of the Prophet and the two people buried beside the Prophet and expand the Haram. To the extent where they say that today the Haram of the Prophet in Mecca, can, in Medina rather, can hold about 60,000 people if it's at full capacity. Their plan, according to the Guardian newspaper based on Saudi plans, is to expand the Haram in Medina to fit 1.6 million people. So basically, I think it's about 14 or 18 times the current size of the masjid. But in doing so, they want to remove the green dome. They want to remove the grave of Rasulullah, just flatten it out. They want to remove any relic of the Messenger of Allah. And obviously they have an agenda because they say that, you know, they want to remove shirk and people going and worshipping the Prophet. As if anybody worships Rasulullah. I mean, in the Salat every day we, had, we testify that the, that, that the Prophet is the Abd of Allah. That he's a servant of Allah. But this is their plan. And this is, you can read this in the newspaper even today, the Guardian newspaper. That their plan is to destroy that part of Masjid al-Nabawi where the Prophet's body is buried. So when you deal with people like that, you can't expect, for example, financial you know, transactions and an open market to happen in Makkah or Medina that Islam envisioned, that the Quran itself tells us that when you go for Hajj, that there is that benefit that you can gain, that material benefit, that financial benefit. And, and, you know, and Islam has never been against financial benefit. You know, in fact, even you look at our Friday prayers that we have, the Friday prayer, Friday, which is the most sacred day for the Muslim community, what happens? We come to prayers and we read Surah Jummah. And Allah says in Surah Jummah that when the Salat is finished, He says, Fantashiru fil ard, wabtahu min fadlillah. He says, Leave when you finish your prayers, go around, travel through the earth, and seek the fadl of Allah, seek the bounties of Allah. And we see that us as a Muslim community, compared to the other traditions, of the people of the book, the Jews and the Christians, we are not prevented or prohibited from working on our holy day. Yes, we take some time to worship Allah on Jummah, but then we go back to work, we go back to school. Other religions, when their holy day comes, and you can read about this in the Quran, they were prevented from all kinds of working. Even fishing, for example, was forbidden for Bani Israel. They were even forbidden to even go and catch fish on their Sabbath. And so what they used to do is they used to try to circumvent the rules of Allah, and they used to develop these mechanisms to catch fish, which wasn't what Allah you know, wanted for them to do, for that particular nation to do. So we see that Islam also gives us a financial benefit for the Hajj. That yes, we go and we spend the days and the weeks in, in Mecca and Medina, but also we have the benefit that we're, we should be able to, again, on a theoretical basis, to come back maybe even more well-off than when we left, because we're able to take things and sell them in the marketplace, and come back with that benefit. Salaw ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. So I'll end there and just again remind ourselves that Hajj is an obligation for all of us who have the ability. If we haven't yet been to Hajj, we should surely make the intention to make us to have the benefit to go for the Hajj. And for those who have been for Hajj, we ask Allah that He accepts that Hajj and that we have the ability to make the trip once again to the sacred lands and to be able to be in the company of the Prophet of Islam and the members of the Ahlul Bayt that are buried in Jannatul Baqi. And I end and I ask again Allah to give us all the tawfiq to stay on the path of Islam, on the path of Muhammad and Ali Muhammad and that he keeps us all on that path and that we can live to see the dawn of our 12th Imam's advent and that we can ensure we, and we work to ensure that our faith and our piety and our awareness of Allah and the Ahlul Bayt is such that when the 12th Imam's advent is here, that we can be amongst the assistants and the servants of our 12th Imam to help him establish the kingdom of God upon the earth, along with Prophet Jesus, alayhi salatu wassalam. Rabbana taqabbal minna innaka anta samir alim. We end off with one salawat upon Muhammad and Ali Muhammad and Surah Al-Fatiha for all of those from our, from our community and our family and our friends who are no longer with us as we celebrate these days of Eid. Surah Al-Mubarakatul Fatiha. اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد